Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and I welcome you to our, well, our sort of monthly live stream, but also serving in the role of my day job as, a, as an instructor at Towson University, where I also happen to be the director of our planetarium, which is fantastic and awesome, and I can't wait to actually have it open to the public. But you know what? We're getting closer and closer to that date. I'm so excited. But we're still going to be doing these things online so that if you don't happen to be in Towson, Maryland and won't be able to drop by for an in-person live planetarium show, don't stress. We got you covered right here. But the great thing about tonight is that we're going to be exploring strange new worlds and new civil... Well, okay, we know of the one civilization and maybe we'll catch another or two someday. But... The thing is that, you know, we're tr we are now living at a time where we get to really start to think more about planets beyond our own. In fact, it's something that has been around in science fiction. I was raised on Star Trek where they always managed to go visit a Class M world, right? A Class M planet, which is, you know, an Earth-like planet, right? <laughs> and uh, now, you know, it was always taken for granted that there should be planets out there beyond our solar system. And yet now we know of many, many, many more planets. So just want to say hello to a few folks here. So uh, construction cronies, uh, Chris, uh, the gray button should be blue, eh, guys? The th oh, the thumbs up button. Sure, if you're if you're watching this and you're enjoying it, feel free to give it a like. And hey, if you uh, would like to let some folks know that you're uh, watching a show uh, tonight about the search for habitable worlds, please do feel free to tweet it out or put it on Facebook or snap gram it or insta word it and whatever the you faces are uh feel free to share the word and uh it's good to have you all here hello ja jason johnson from japan konnichiwa i hope uh, you're having a wonderful morning and howdy from portland and launchpad class of 2011 thank you jennifer wills and by the way that does as a bit of a public service announcement uh now that we are finally getting out of this thing the launchpad writers workshop for writers so if you are a writer whether it's science fiction fantasy nonfiction, you know screenwriting editing if you're a youtube creator and you want to learn how to uh ex you know explain astronomy better if you just want to learn the astronomy really consider applying for our workshop it's at launchpadworkshop.org uh maybe if uh, one of my mods can uh you know mention that in the in the comments uh put that in the chat uh, a link to the launchpad workshop uh feel free to apply if you are a creative professional of any stripe well, anyway uh so like i was starting to say sorry about that so like i was starting to say you know once upon a time we didn't know for sure if there were other planets beyond our solar system and now we do Right. But just to kind of put it into perspective, I mean, going all the way back to 1992, OK, which I realize for some of you is, you know, a lifetime ago. But still, back in 92, we discovered the very first, not one, but actually three extrasolar planets or exoplanets, as we call them. These are planets beyond our solar system. And, you know, it 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 made a few headlines. It was in the, it was in a couple of papers and so forth. Thank you, Jerry. I really do appreciate that. Uh, so. You know there were a little there was a little bit of buzz but then uh, a couple of years later in 1995 this planet was discovered it's called 51 pegasi b and the great thing about 51 peg is not the planet so much as the fact that a it's a planet but it was orbiting a sun like star you see the first three planets were discovered around a, a pair of dead stars called neutron stars or pulsars since they're rotating so fast so everyone was kind of like, ah, it's just, a, you know, three planets, so what? They're, it's around dead stars. Are there any planets around sun-like stars? And what do you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. they exist. I mean, they're not the sorts of things you want to go visit. They're kind of hot. They're kind of close. They formed a new class of planet called hot Jupiters because they orbit so close and they're about the same mass as Jupiter. But since then, we found a few more. Okay, and so now we are starting to think very differently about the nature of exoplanets and we're starting to think among you know the, the big question that's on everybody's mind is are there other planets like earth right is there an earth 2.0 so far we haven't seemed to have found any single earth 
analog planet where we found maybe some candidates, but nothing definitively that we know is Earth. But more broadly speaking, right, we're trying to understand if other worlds are capable of hosting life. I mean, are they simply habitable? And our definition of what constitutes a habitable planet has been challenged lately. Maybe it's beyond pure Earth-like conditions. And that's why I'm excited to have my guest with us tonight to help us uh, understand what these alternate conditions might be, as well as what we mean when we say a habitable planet. His name is Professor Abel Mendez, and he is, uh, the, he is the director of the Planetary Habitability Lab at the University of Puerto Rico in Arecibo, or at Arecibo. And uh, not only is he, not only is uh, Abel a, uh, a, an astrophysicist, an astrobiologist, and uh, director of this uh, exoplanet habitability workshop, but he is also a very gifted artist. And he, per, he created this beautiful, beautiful uh, representation of all of these candidate planets that may support life of some sort. They may be habitable planets. And if you look in the upper right hand corner, one of those planets might seem particularly familiar to you. Uh, now, I'm just noticing that I may not, he may not be here. Oh, there he is. He's my man. It's my guy right here. This is Professor Abel Mendez. Uh, good evening, Professor, and thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Uh, hello, Christian. Uh, glad to be with you today here. I'm happy, very happy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so glad you can come and, and do this with us tonight, uh, Abel. So what I wanted to know is, did I, did I kind of maybe set that up sort of kind of right? Like, are we really starting to think a little bit differently beyond the, the class M Earth-like planets from Star Trek? Are we thinking about them any differently now than we did maybe 50 years ago? Oh, yes. Uh, now, as you say, we have the proof that there are planets out there. Um, actually, when we started to... We, Sorry about well, that. I, my, I actually had you muted there by, by mistake. I apologize for that. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, we have a, a broad idea of what these planets uh, might be out there, but uh, we got a few surprises, like planets like too close to the star and being very big like Jupiter, which we thought initially they were not be able to form. And that was one of surprise. Actually, the first exoplanets around the pulsar was something unexpected, not only because uh, there was the first planet, but also planets around a dead star. The, that star, the, those new, neutron star pulsar had a big uh, explosion as a supernova. And then uh, how those planets survive? Now we think that those planets were formed after uh, the, uh, star die as a pulsar, mm -hmm. so uh, so that's quite interesting. So this is a very old system. So these planets and, uh, you said they may have formed uh -huh. after the the two mm -hmm. pulsars form. So the two pulsars form in a a pair of supernovae, and mm -hmm. then what? These planets formed from the guts of those uh, exploded stars. It's thought or yes, from the material left over from the explosion. Wow. Then because they're all as far as we know, all the models say that they should if they were before, they will be stripped out of the of the system through the explosion. So they're most likely formed after. So and we are very intrigued. And that's fascinating. And probably more fascinating about habitable planets, because uh, Earth is an example that uh habitable planets are possible in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, planet with life. So we know at least one example, but these are planets around a dead star that form after. They could be really weird, something like we have never seen in the solar system. So that's interesting. That planet and living planets, <laughs> they're good to explore. So, uh, when, so when we're talking about uh, well, let, let me just come it back, come back a little bit to this concept of habitability. I mean, you know, we are thinking beyond just planets with uh, with Earth-like conditions, right? I mean, that seems like the low-hanging fruit. If we could find that, then there's a. I would think it's reasonable to assume that it is in fact habitable. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would show you something that probably helps the audience. Sure. 
just to understand uh, what we mean with a habitable planet. So let's start by using the classical elements. And I love this analogy because it simplifies a lot what we need to look for. So the classical elements are air, water, earth, and fire. We have seen that a lot, especially in the media. And uh, more technically, what I mean is that a planet or any environment at all to be considered potentially habitable, it has to have a gas, liquid, and solid. So the three phases of matter. So why? There are many reasons, but one, one of the most important reasons is that the elements necessary for life, they are not in a single phase. So you need all these phases to get together, to be combined, not separated. So all these elements get mixed. Plus an energy source like, uh, like light from the star or chemical energy. So this analogy, it, it looks so simple, but actually in what we do in our lab, this analogy, we have a, a mathematical model that consider all these parameters. Okay. And then, and so it's, you, it's, it's, it's neat. <laughs> so you said that you're, you, have a, you have a model that takes all of these into account. Are, are you saying that um, you can build planets in a computer, so to speak? Yeah, we can uh, simulate what uh, habitable environments will look like, and uh, not only considering uh, life as, as, as we know it, also other conditions. Because in the end, no matter what life you are considering, it will need mass and energy. And these resources, this analogy of the classical elements are the resources for any kind of life. And we can try to now apply this analogy to Earth. And when we do that, so we see that forests are full of life. Life is visible. And that the reason is that plants and animals need lots of energy and mass, nutrients from the environment. And you have plenty of the air, the atmosphere, you have rain, that's the water, you have the, the surface, the soil that provides the nutrients and you have the energy light. But it's amazing that in a planet that we consider so habitable like Earth, we have this desert where there's a strong limitation of water and to the eye, it doesn't look like there is no life there. No, there is actually microbial life everywhere. And uh, if we look for uh, ice layers, it has the same problem. There's plenty of water, water there, but that water has to be liquid. If we look at the clouds, the problem with the clouds is that they don't have enough nutrient because they precipitate. And the ocean surface, lots of water. And I was expecting that probably to the eye, I will see the, the water covered by plant life everywhere in the ocean, but it's not. And most of the animal life there is mostly concentrated to the coast where there are more nutrients. And in the deep ocean, there are two limitations. You have that there's no much air atmosphere and there's not much light energy. So it looks again in a, like a desert for life. And this is amazing. And now you realize that from this analogy of the classical element, if you want a planet just like Earth, you need a lot of this. And the only way to get a lot of this classical elements is a land. So you need a plant with a planet with land, oceans, rain. It's very important. Otherwise, you will have mostly deserts of life. Life, will, you, you will be able to have life, but it will be minimal in terms of abundance of that kind of life. Could you, uh, so we have, oh, I'm sorry, I think I've got the wrong, uh, <laughs> I've got the wrong screen up here. Let me see, I'm going to go back to your slides, uh, ML. Uh -huh. This is where I wanted to be, sorry about that. So you're saying that it, you think that there, it's possible that life could exist on a pure ocean planet, like a planet that did not, I mean, I know it sounds, I know of course we have life in our oceans, but you're saying that land may not be the sole re, or the critical requirement for uh, for life to exist? 
you can have life in the atmosphere, you can have life in the ocean, but it will be very limited, only probably okay. just microbial life. If we want planet with plants, animals, and then intelligent life, it has to have land and oceans. That's the only way. The most productive place on our planet, or we can say the more habitable place in our planet are forests. That's where most of the biomass right. per unit of space and time can be produced. Okay. Ocean doesn't compare to that. So, so okay, so e even though the ocean has lots and lots of life in it, it's just not the density, I guess you said, of life, right? You said the biomass, per right? So it, it's, it's a bit more diffuse, it's a bit more spread out. Um, and I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. my early evolutionary biology class that I took, oh, I don't know, a lifetime ago. But, um, you know, we do have, of course, very complex life in the oceans. But again, as you say, not super complex, not certainly, well, I don't want to say not intelligent, I mean, whales and, and dolphins, but hey, they're mammals, right? They they descended from land creatures, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, but uh, if you're interested also in sure. intelligent life and you're considering oceans, the problem is that you need a lot of energy for uh, building fire, making fire. Mm. And it would be hard, very hard to do underwater unless, because you need to melt metals to uh, and other uh, materials, and the issue, unless the plant, the they have uh, spaceships or technology out of rock and wood, then or coral in this case, <laughs> they, they won't be that intelligent. So I'm showing here uh, our solar si the uh, oceans in the solar system, and is Earth and Mars, and this is how much water we have in our planet and you see that our planet is so blue that should be called uh, ocean instead of earth. But now the earth is fine as a name because actually the layer of water is very small. It's just four kilometer deep in average through our whole planet. So compared to the size of our planet, we don't have that much water and probably Mars had about the same uh, fraction by mass in the very uh, early in since history. But if we look at the moons of uh, Jupiter, Europa, and Ganymede, and in particular Europa, you see they have, it even has, and this Europa here is too scared to air, it has more water, a lot more water, more than two times water. And this is only the liquid water, because uh, you see here the white, this is ice, and that ice could be 10 kilometers. Of, of just ice, and below that ice is this much water. So about a hundred kilometer deep oceans. So, okay, so now this is the first time I'm starting to really consider Earth as having a, a shallow layer of water compared to, <laughs> I mean, yes, it's, that, that's- It's a wet rock. It's a wet rock. It's a wet rock. <laughs> It's a wet rock. If you, put, if you take a rock and put in the water, the yep. layer of water in the rock will be deeper in, to scale than the oceans in our planet. So this is very small layer, just four wow. kilometers. Wow, I never considered that. That's amazing. And then people, when we explain this, uh, that the, these moons could have that much water, people die tend to believe, oh, so they should have uh, uh, big fish and uh, whales and um, big animals. But if you apply the classical elements here, the analogy, and you say, okay, so this ocean is below a 10 kilometer deep of ice, something much deeper than any ice in our planet. This is a dark ocean. So you don't sure. have that much night light hmm. then uh you have an atmosphere so definitely you will have gases dissolved in that water you have uh coming from the core but that won't be enough so you won't have that much gases and like oxygen for example in that water so this is worse much worse than any environment here on air even the deep uh environments in the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest point on Earth, are 11 kilometers deep. So this is much worse than that. And in those places on Earth, life is transient. It's not a place that this animal life could live for a long time. 
it relies on the precipitation of nutrients from the top of the surface of the oceans to the bottom. And you, you won't have this uh, advantage here anyway. Well, at, so at, at this... the risk of jumping uh, ahead of something, if, in case you're planning to bring this up a moment ago, because this raises a question. Actually, I see that a question was already asked, uh, and I'd like to bring it up here on screen here. Uh, Crypt uh, Cryptolicious asks, so maybe your European uh, octopi could make a hot geyser steampunk civilization, no fire needed. And I was thinking very much along the same lines. I mean, we've all speculated, or we hope, that there's life in the oceans of Europa. Mm -hmm. and that that life would be found around uh, hydrothermal vents, right, like we see here on Earth. Does this in any way suggest that well, maybe not, or or it would just be a very primitive yeah. life, or what? Well, that uh, f for hydrothermal vents, that would be another issue. At least in those conditions, you will have more energy from geothermal energy. You will have more gases. And that might be able to produce something larger by mass. So you will have a, a much higher productivity. Probably not as much as the case of Earth, because you also do, don't have oxygen there. It will be other gases. And uh, for complex life, usually oxygen could provide enough energy for, uh, for their metabolism. But still, uh, you can have more. But in general, the ocean will be uh, really bad. And uh, if we try to uh, search for life in this kind of environment, and here I just added uh, Titan and uh, Enceladus, which have uh, more water still uh, underneath their uh, surface layer wow. of ice, <laughs> then uh, that uh, might only be able uh, to have enough mass and energy per unit of space and time for supporting microbial life. So these are extreme environments compared in terms of mass of energy, what is available here on Earth, even the worst environment. And, uh, and then you have to still have life anyway. <laughs> and then that life has to uh, uh, sustain these conditions and, uh, and, and be supported by these limited conditions. So it doesn't matter if it's a, it's a, it's a life as we know it or not you cannot create more mass of energy from the environment. Hmm. It will be limited by that. It could be more efficient to, to be sustained, but right. still you not, cannot create something more than so, what is available. So really, uh, I mean, you know, again, you're taking it back to the idea of the uh, classical elements, but you need energy, right? You need, you need, the, the more complex the life is, the, the more energy is needed to create it, which I think is, is kind of fair. I mean, like, just on a simple, practical thinking about it, but but wow, that's an interesting uh, thought. That okay, you're you sure you're going to have the hydrothermal vents, but they probably won't give you the energy requirement needed to make really really complicated uh, you know life. Uh, well, that's a shame. And by the way, uh, I don't know if anybody here watching this uh, is anybody here kind of amazed about what we're seeing on this screen. I mean, take a look at the screen for a second. Which body has the greatest percentage of liquid water? It's Enceladus, that little thing right there, right? So put something, let, let me know if this is something that you already knew or suspected or this is all new to you, okay? Because I want to see, you know, if I'm the only one, I mean, I'm probably, I'm probably the only dumb guy here. But you know what? I'm happy to be that guy. I just want to know if you guys have seen what we're seeing right here. Just think about this, folks. Earth is... A wet rock, right? As uh, Professor Mendez says, right? It's a wet rock, and we've got these really, really, really oceanic worlds that just blow Earth away in terms of like the percentage of water on it. So I'm still kind of like not getting past this graphic, um, but now now we're finding out that yeah, you know what? You're probably going to need a lot more energy. So Earth is kind of like that, kind of in the middle, right? It's got the energy, but it doesn't have too much water, I guess, or water. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm from Philadelphia, yeah, so we say water up there all the time. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, you know, the problem is that if you have too much water, so the planet is covered by ocean, then you will have less land available at the surface layer to uh, put more nutrients 
because it's not that you have the land there, but also wind moves that uh, uh, dust, which precipitate mm. and provide nutrients to the planet globally. And uh, like, uh, uh, like a desert uh, uh, dust everywhere. And we have the, the Sahara Desert, even in the Atlantic. <laughs> so that provides nutrients. But if you don't have land at all, so the only way those nutrients will be able to come from the bottom up, and that's much harder. And the thing is that uh, that water will dilute everything and everything will precipitate. And uh, it will be clear waters, not that much nutrients. And if you, uh, 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 so, uh, volcanoes in the bottom of the ocean might provide some, uh, some plumes coming up huh. and uh, a temporary uh, a good environment for uh, the life there, but still for microbial life. But otherwise, uh, it will be something uh, change so much water and not that much life, at least uh, visible life, like on a planet. So you need to have the ocean, you need to have the land. If you don't have enough water and you're a desert planet, so now you have another problem. You don't have in, enough water for that uh, life, which is mostly hmm. life. And from this, now we learn from basic requirements applied to biomes in our planet, to the solar system, and then we can move forward to something more complicated, like exoplanets. And here is our catalog of potentially habitable planet. We established this catalog. We started this catalog in um, 2011. There were only about one or two objects at that time. And we thought about maybe it's not a good idea to have a catalog because I would not expect that many to be, to be discovered in the near future, but um, it was good. <laughs> We discovered many in the following years. And uh, so here I'm showing you 24 objects, the best candidates so far. The only real thing in this image is their size with respect to Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune here. And I say that because all these are artistic representation. As you mentioned, we created a software also during this time to make this artistic representation. So the size here is correct. The only correct thing here is that we know their orbit. And from their orbit, we have some idea of their temperature. We know they are in the habitable zone. The region, the orbital region necessary to have, if they have water, to be uh, uh, that water liquid. So there in that we uh, we know their orbit, which is a good orbit for 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 uh, having water, and we know their size, which is also a good size because if it is too small, it would be like, like Mars, no atmosphere, an important ingredient. If they are too big, they will have too much atmosphere. If you have too much atmosphere, the water, the pressure at the surface level will be so high that even uh, liquid water will be solid. Even when 1% of the planet mass is just atmosphere, the pressure will be too high and water will be, no matter the temperature, will be solid. So in water has to be liquid. I just I just wanted to uh, chirp in here, just say that I, I just uh, showed a, uh, uh, a graphic of the habitable zone. So basically it's just that region, that distance from the campfire, right, which is the star uh, mm -hmm. at the center where it's neither too hot nor too too cold for liquid water to remain stable right but that doesn't necessarily mean that the planet is automatically has life i mean it's isn't it a bit of a misnomer to call it the habitable zone around a star well yeah, that was kind uh, of right uh, now yes yeah, that's true that's true that was <laughs> the initial name uh that paper came in 1994 <laughs> that that uh, popularized the term the term exists before but it was popularized so Potentially habitable zone or the water zone will be probably better names. But anyway, the idea is that this is the right zone. And uh, we don't know, what we don't know here is how much atmosphere these planets have. 
we don't know how much water they have. And now we can say, okay, maybe some of these planets are just desert planets. They, they have the right temperatures. They are, because they are in the habitable zone, they have the right side to have a good atmosphere, but they have no water and they will be desert planets. No good, uh, contrary to what you see in science fiction, <laughs> that uh, like Tatooine with planet full of life, this is it's a planet for visiting, uh, probably have a, a pop or something, but it, it's not a planet for a development of life and evolution of complex life. So, and this, um, uh, so probably the one, uh, many of these planets are ocean planets, which is not good anyway. So we don't know which category are these planets, which are what we uh, like to call in Star Trek M planets. So planet with ocean and continents, that's the big mystery. So we may be looking here, uh, maybe they are all desert planets, maybe they are all ocean planets. Maybe just a few are Earth-like. They have ocean and continents. And those are the ones that will be able to have forests because of the rain. Then you need a large reservoir of water. Right. And that water will provide the rain. So at the land, they will have enough. Uh, you have land, you have the atmosphere, you have that water. And then you have the energy of the star, you have forests, you have food, you have animals, and then animals will develop eventually intelligent life. So many things has to go right to ha that for to happen. Okay, so we have a few barriers to clear before we can get to uh, uh, intelligent, at least, you know, life that has the potential to communicate with us at some point down the road, right? But uh, as far as just simpler life is that a big deal uh is that something that i, I kind of think that would be a big deal even if we found so much as a microbe on mars um but it's almost like there's a certain presumption that there probably is life or you know we don't know we have we have one data point it's earth right mm -hmm. yeah uh, i think that uh once you pass the barrier of first having life the origin of life maybe that's something uh not that easy to happen but then that that uh, microbial life has to survive for uh, all the changes and stellar changes, stellar dangers, the light impact or meteorites, supernovae exploding nearby the planet. So there are many things could go wrong, and uh, probably so microbial life is more a lot more common than uh, uh, animal or, or plant life or even intelligent life. Well, that's good to know. I mean, you know, we, we are kind of, uh, you know, Earth is really home to the microbes and there's some other stuff uh, on the planet as far as we know, right? Uh, but, um, you know, like, there's my cat, you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's about it. But it's mostly a microbial world, right? And I think that's what you're saying. Like, everything we're going to find, we, we would expect or... We shouldn't ex we shouldn't expect microbes to be very uncommon. Let's just I'm, I guess I'm being very generous when I say it that way, right? Uh, I like to if you don't mind we have a we have a number of questions that have come in here, including some super chats, which I want to thank and and do some quick shout outs for uh, right here. And I would like to get to as many of these questions as possible, but I do want to try to give a little bit of a, a well. This is not really a question, but uh, Munich, thank you so much uh, for uh, I believe that's Norwegian 109. Thank you very kindly. I really do appreciate that and we also have uh, another super chat uh, from Nicholas uh, Paulson and uh, he asked uh, isn't the ionizing radiation this goes back to Jupiter right so isn't the ionizing radiation surrounding Jupiter kind of terrible for life on any of those moons doesn't seem yeah, good thanks. to me but what do you yeah think? thanks Nicholas for the question thank you definitely yeah the the um, the Jupiter environment has a lot of ionizing radiation but you have have this moon that's protected by that much ice, even 10 kilometers at least of ice. So that will definitely provide enough protection for any life in the ocean. In the ocean, Which, but life on the surface it, doesn't have a chance, basically. No, life on the surface, no, it will, it will, <laughs> it will destroy any, any life in the surface. I, I, I would, I would 
assume as well. I mean, I know there's not much. Europa has a little bit of an atmosphere, but nothing that I think life could breathe. But even if it no. did, forget about it. You're just you're just cooked. Yeah, I, I totally understand <laughs> that. Uh, we also have. Uh, oh my gosh, we have another. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm getting to all these uh, super chats here. But I promise I'm gonna get to the ones. That, uh, oh, well, Elliot, thank you very very much. Wow, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing such great education. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Really do appreciate that. A super generous $100 super chat. Okay, so I'm going to go have a drink. I am blown away by this uh, generosity. Thank you so much. <laughs> but while I'm while I'm I'm doing that, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going anywhere. I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to raise a, uh, another question here. Um, and some of these go back a little ways here. But, uh, you know, th there's a Cryptolicious asked, what do you think about panspermia? What is panspermia? What do you mean by that? And, and is that likely? In your well, the origin of life is a, is, is a complex problem. We still don't know how to create life. We know what it means. Uh, we know how, how it's constructed. But we don't know and we don't have the ability to actually uh, construct life from scratch in the laboratory. It is surprising that our planet uh, life started very early on, and that could mean that maybe life came from elsewhere. And that's the idea of panspermia, that uh, microbial life or life in general could be transferred probably through a meteor base, uh, raining on planets, and uh, the origin of life were somewhere else. And then eventually one of those uh, uh, meteorites landed everywhere. Those meteorites landed everywhere. Definitely, if, if uh, life started elsewhere and there were uh, spread through the solar system, then uh, every uh, object in the solar system had a share of those. So, but only in a good planet, not a planet that went too hot like Venus, not a planet that went too cold like Mars. That was not good to make that the environment stable enough for that life to evolve. So we don't know actually where uh, uh, life came from. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to assume as a starting point that uh, probably the easiest solution is just form of Earth, right. because if, we, if you say that it came from Earth, where, well, but how, <laughs> where? <laughs> So you're transferring and making the problem more complicated. I see. It came somewhere. So you and what we try to understand is how the process started. Right. And actually, the necessary steps to start life are not necessarily the same steps for keeping that life hmm. for habitability. And that's something interesting. Maybe it needs a, a let, let's speculate. Maybe it's organic material in comet. And during the process of this star forming and the UV radiation, and that stimulates the aggregation and it melts in the nucleus and of those comets. And that's the first uh, complex molecules that will be needed to for life to develop. And, and they now have to wait for a and they froze over once time passed through and they're there when they land in a good planet with a good temperature and more water they will spread and mix with everybody else, everything else and that's the starting of life so uh, we need to understand anyway any uh way it happened we need to understand how it happened and then another uh Generous super chat from Nicholas uh, Paulson. Uh, how much more information on habitable planets? 50 Corona, thank you very kindly, Nicholas. Awesome. Uh, how much more information on habitable planets will we have from JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope? And when will we get the first results from James? Oh boy, <laughs> that, that second question, that's, that's all I love. <laughs> the, the just wait yeah, space but telescope. I love that question because I have a, 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 a visual to accompany that, to answer okay. that question. Well, look at this. All right. Uh, let me let me bring it up here for you. Take it away. No, wrong one. Uh, no, let me go back to this one. Sorry about that, everybody. Oh, gonna get this over here. One of these, one of these days, I'll figure out how to do this job. <laughs> so, so let's put in context what we know so far about this planet and where are we going. So for today, in the last 10 years, we know their orbit and size. 
And I told you already that from the orbit, you know something about the temperature, but uh, that's not necessarily correct because that temperature will also depend on the atmosphere and you don't know the atmosphere. But it's a starting point. So you don't know the orbit that size. So that's why these planets not, are potentially habitable. They might have, they have at least some conditions necessary for life, but we don't know if they have other conditions. And in the next 10 years, then that includes the work of the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, we will start to look for the next logical step, the atmosphere of this planet. Uh, taking advantage of the transit method, we will sample the atmosphere by, op by telescopes, and by using a, a, a spectroscopy to understand the chemistry of the atmosphere. And we might be able to detect water, uh, carbon dioxide, oxygen on this planet. Actually, we have done that already, at least with the big planets. Big planets are easier to, to, uh, to understand the atmosphere. We have done that in since 2019 for smaller planets, almost the size of Earth size already. So we are getting closer. We start already. But for the planets that I show you in our catalog, we haven't done that yet because they are too small and the signal is very weak and you need a telescope like the James Webb in space. So that's the next step. Going to uh, find planets, those potentially planets, and now to characterize, starting with the atmosphere. So that's the job of the 10 years. And in the process of understanding the atmosphere, if you see that a planet has oxygen, that would be tantalizing because oxygen tend to react with everything, chemistry. And uh, so, and life is one of the process that could replenish. And I say one of the processes because we know now that there are other natural processes that could accumulate oxygen in the atmosphere. So it, was, it won't be the final uh, uh, nail to say that a planet has life. But methane is another gas that is rare within the atmosphere with oxygen together because they tend to react with each other. And on Earth, they, those two are responsible, uh, life is re are responsible for those two. Huh. So if we have a, a final planet of oxygen and methane, that will be really interesting. That we will say, well, so far we don't know any uh, natural way to keep those two gases for a long time in, in the atmosphere of the right. planet. So the oxygen we keep. We're, you know, we're breathing it out. I mean, I know we, I know we exhale of CO2, but we also exhale oxygen as well. Uh, you know. mm -hmm. um, and then the methane, we release that other in, by other mechanisms. But anyway, the, both of them are biological, basically. Both of them are so biological. But the, Fantastic. I mean, then. and then so, so we have the opportunity not only to uh, see the atmosphere of this planet, but also maybe the bonus will be way we might be able in these 10 years with James Webb to actually say this planet has life if we detect those two gases. Probably you will need a um, better telescope than James Webb to sample uh, oxygen and methane together, but there is right. a good chance in, this thing, in these 10 years. And the other thing, in 20 years, we have probably some information about the surface, like if they have yeah. continents and oceans. We won't be able to see the planet as a as, as a as a disk jet. You will only see the planet as a dot. Okay. But as the planet rotates, it will become brighter because of the land areas, hmm. darker because of the oceans, which are darker. And that would be the telltale that oh, this planet has land and ocean, and that's precisely the planet that we're looking for, with land and ocean. If the planet is covered with ice, uh, clouds all desert, all ocean, it won't have any change. So that way we will have more information about this, uh, about the surface of the planet. And probably we will estimate better the temperature in this process. That's in 20 years with new telescopes that are designed, but no missions yet approved. And in 30 years life, by looking at that, like looking at the planet as a, uh, uh, as a dot, still as a dot, you will analyze that light and look for the uh, 
like that tells you that there is the greens of the plant in the plant which tell that this land is not only covered, uh, it's just land, but it's covered by the green of plants huh. or some life of uh, form. So that's, the good thing is, is this is not uh, forever. <laughs> this is 20, 30 years, and um, um, probably in between, we will have a, a, a few surprises. And uh, that's good, that's good. But many people ask me, Okay, but what about intelligent life? I am interested in intelligent life, that in animal life, complex life, and this uh, detection of life is, you won't be sure if this is a, a planet like Earth now with complex life, or it's just like Earth long time ago when vegetation started and there were still not that many animals and it was still a primitive planet. So I want to know more. Well. If you want to know more, you have to, you will have to go to these planets, and that might take a hundred or, or thousand years. And uh, we're thinking oh, now okay. about traveling through uh, between the stars. But there is a a, a a a way long before doing that to do something. Mm -hmm. Let's say Earth from the nearest star. Well, this is a close-up view of Earth okay. now from orbit but if we build a 10 kilometer uh optical telescope and the receive observatories compared to scale there which was oh, okay. just uh 300 meters 0.3 kilometers if we build a 10 kilometer telescope from the nearest star and we looked at the same close-up picture of air it would look like this now it's not a dot it's not a dot it's not a... and you can't it's... you don't see you don't see land ocean, but you get that color information though. Yes. That mm -hmm. units, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's sort of like, mm -hmm. you can see how they kind of correlate. They got the, you got the brown corresponding uh, to the green and the, and the ocean. So even though it's not like a, a picture picture, that would be a pretty convincing image to a trained eye, I yeah. assume, right? Yeah, and, and, the, and the planet rotates. You will see more details and you will see that the uh, weather patterns are, are more uh, ice. It, may, it will make the dots wider and the cloud cover and the, where, is it, where is more land. And eventually, through many observations, you will construct a much better map than this uh, pixelate. Okay, so you can but, improve that over time. Yes, yeah. and then uh, this is a... a 10 kilometers, which sounds far fetched because wow, That's it doesn't nice. have to be, a, yeah, it doesn't have to be a, a, in one piece. Actually, it's better to control it in, better, in many pieces oh, yeah, okay, to right. our planet. Right. An array of telescopes, like the ones used for the, uh, to map the um, uh, black hole. Yeah, right. The Event uh, Horizon uh, Telescope, they had telescopes <laughs> from around the Earth. You know, yes, you, them you, you need you need to have this telescope separate and this and that will improve the resolution. Uh -huh. So, uh, OK. And but if we build a 10 kilometer telescope, why not bigger? Sure. A hundred well, kilometer go. telescope, which will be uh, uh, hey. almost as big as, as my island. That was as big so, as Puerto Rico. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah. So that telescope will be visible in this in this picture. And here is is it just it, probably you see here uh, Cuba, then yeah. Puerto Rico somewhere oh, there's Puerto there. Puerto Rico is like a little pixel yes. in Puerto Rico, so you can actually see the telescope in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is much better. This is much better. And people Let's say, well, that. but, but what? constructing this telescope will be as harder than traveling to there. No. There will be much, much cheaper. Huh. Is is uh, they uh, building a, the problem with traveling to the stars with the technology that we know and right, you have to pack a lot. We'll be having the future. Then the problem is that uh, it's mostly time because you can build a rocket today and launch it to the stars, and it will take for the nearest star 70, 80, uh, thousand years. And you cannot wait for that long, and the and the warranty even of the rocket the... won't hold. Okay, even even and with then... even with Netflix. Uh, okay, you're not gonna. Yeah, okay, I can understand. It's a lot. So so you're saying that this is a a theoretical, you know, this is a hypothetical image of an Earth-like planet surrounding, say, 
mm, Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri, mm -hmm. which is only mm -hmm. for a little over four light years away. So mm -hmm. what do we think, everybody? Uh, I think we ought to build this 100 kilometer telescope. Let us know in the chat below. <laughs> it's kind of like a, it's called engagement. But anyway, no, but I mean, seriously, <laughs> like, is that crazy or what? I, we could do a whole other hour just talking about this this telescope, but uh, but it seems like, at least in principle, yeah, it and would the, be and the possible thing is, to image nearby exoplanets without having yeah. to even necessarily go to space. Of course, you're yeah. inside Earth's atmosphere and, and all that kind of stuff. And because this is cheaper, mm -hmm. we will be constructing this telescope maybe 40 years, 50 years into the future, maybe earlier. We'll be constructing this kind of telescope long before we have the capability to draw it through the stars. So we will be mapping all these worlds and the catalog of uh, our catalog of exoplanets. We have short images <laughs> of the of this world. And still, but I was trying to build this telescope to know more and, and to see there is intelligence life there. And still, even in the close-up view of our planet, we don't see intelligence life there. We don't see our cities. And, uh, but there is something that you can do because if you look at this, this planet through the night time, guess what? You will see the lights of You'd the see city. some lights. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Let's that will tell thing. you that. The, there you go. Becky that, said, you got this. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Build it. <laughs> yeah, you will see the lights. And if you look at this planet and you, you see through the night time, it's just dark. Well, maybe that planet still doesn't have yet intelligent life, or they don't like to. They like the dark. Uh, Eugene, Eugene, uh, Seidel, and by the way, Eugene, I did see your question from earlier, so I'm glad you're reminding me of it right now. Uh, so, the detection of green in 30 years is that chlorophyll we're talking about? Yeah, chlorophyll. Pretty yeah. much. There are other alternatives, or alternative, but the the thing is, it could be a reddish. For the whole planet, but is uh, it, it will be different from a land core, and you will notice the difference. Okay, all right, and uh, and Nicholas says let's start by building Louvoir, right? That's the large uh, ultraviolet optical infrared telescope, basically the thing that makes the James Webb Space Telescope seem kind of small and you know quaint <laughs> by comparison. Uh, I I do want to just. Um, Oh, thank you very much, Becky. It's so kind of you to say that. Appreciate that very much. And uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, let me try to bring up a question. Well, I think we've gotten. Uh, so I didn't. So I don't think I forgot your question about chlorophyll. Uh, will future space probe be able to detect spectroscopic evidence of chlorophyll and exoplanet proof of life? And when? I think I think we now have an idea of when that could in principle happen. Uh, and then this is going back to something that was uh, discussed earlier, also by Eugene, bring back microbial life to Earth. Well, I'm sure it's a good idea. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, you never know. Just, you know, risk it. You know, it, what, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> and, um, you know, I think there was a, actually, uh, I, oh, and there was another, oh gosh, there was another super chat I wanted to recognize and, and give thanks for. Uh, let's see, uh, Marcus, thank you very very kindly for that super chat really do appreciate it it certainly helps to keep the lights on so thanks so much now let me uh if you don't mind uh because i know we're already coming up toward the end of the hour it's amazing just how quickly the time can go by but um okay so uh i do have okay so i do have a uh, okay, enter the CARP. Uh, I'm sorry, last one. Look for high iron signatures in the target spectroscopy in regards to my previous post. So I'm sorry I don't have time to scroll back all the way through, but uh, it sounds like we're talking about uh, having iron forming in the crust of Earth, which I guess in principle we could pick up that in spectroscopy as well. That would be iron. It will be much harder unless yeah. it's, it's in the cloud of iron because it was so hot the environment. And uh, but the iron is very abundant in the universe and uh, and is in the core of all planets. Absolutely, yeah. So you find it mostly in the cores. You don't find it as much uh, on the surface. We have little bits of iron here and there on the surface, but you're right. There's not a whole mm -hmm. lot to, to just immediately pick up uh, in spectroscopy. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so, Abel, I think, you know, you mentioned the Arecibo telescope. Obviously, you know, it, it, we, we, we really ought to address the elephant in the room. Um, you know, I'm so sorry about what happened to uh, Arecibo. 
Um, I was wondering, you know, I know that you're there at Arecibo, and I was wondering if you uh, could speak to that. Is there, I mean, I know this had to have been a very hard loss, uh, not just for you personally, but also, well, also just, you know, for astronomy in general, and I think maybe even uh, Puerto Rico in general. It's a bit of a, it's become a bit of a cultural uh, icon as well, right? Yes, uh, as part of, we do in our laboratory is mostly it, everything related to planetary habitability, the theory, but we also do experimental work, observation work with the Arecibo Observatory. We're looking at many of these stars that we know have potentially habitable planets. We're not looking at the planets. We are not uh, looking like, uh, because this telescope is better to detect pulsar planets. But I am interested in habitable planets and uh, is, there's no way to detect uh, this planet with a in radio signal yet. But at least I can look at the stars and the emissions that, uh, that these stars, especially red dwarf stars, which are probably not that good for this kind of planet because they are very active, not like our sun, which is a quiet star. And because they, these red dwarf stars emit the flares. And I can see that easily from a receivable. And we have been doing that for some time. And uh, even through the pandemic, because all the good thing about an old telescope is that everything is set, it, everything is calibrated, everything works automatically, and uh, most of the users were elsewhere using the telescope from out of the world through remotely through computers. And because I am right there, uh, I just came uh, once in a while to observatory to actually do physically in the observatory the observations. And I remember the last one I did observation was in February. Then through the pandemic, I did most of the observations remotely. Last one was in August uh, 2020, a Thursday. And by Monday next week, we heard that the first cable, an auxiliary cable of the uh, holding the platform, the 900 uh, tons platform, uh, lose and did some damage observations and we thought okay. oh that's not it's, it's just an auxiliary cable that won't be that big problem it will be replaced for probably a few months this was, it never happened before this was august of last year you said yes august okay. mm -hmm. uh, 2020 yes and then uh so the so we thought maybe it didn't happen something like that before but uh two three months estimate to replace it was an auxiliary cable not one of the four big cables holding right the the arena cable holding the the uh, four by, by by tower and they're three towers. So then uh, by November, one of the uh, uh, main cables uh, just fa had a failure, and and then we realized that was by uh, mid uh, or early November. And then we realized, oh, this is uh, now this, there's a big problem. There's a big problem, one of the main cables. And, uh, and there was ideas of how to fix it. But uh, now we, we knew it was very unstable that uh, people working through this process, something could go wrong very easily. And in December 1st, so the t telescope collapsed, collapsed. So the receiver observatory is, is still working in the facility. But uh, that uh, platform just collapsed. So we lo lose the telescope, but there are other instruments around that scientists are using. The receiver is still working and the, uh, the facility and the scientists are there. Uh, builders are fine. It's just the main uh, iconic instrument is the, the one thing that we lose. And I, uh, I apologize that was for that. For... I had the uh, I had the uh, audio of that uh, clip running, and I uh, didn't mean to uh, over overshadow what you were saying because um, I just no wanted... problem. I, I figured most people here knew have seen this footage, but I figured I would just uh, share it just to kind of put it back into context. Uh, this this was a this was a real gut punch when I saw it too, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember that it was uh, that early morning. It was about close to eight a.m. Uh, the collapse in, in the morning that uh, Monday, uh, December 1st, and I got a, an, a message through one of my colleagues that the telescope collapsed. I didn't ask 
uh, more questions because I knew, okay, it happened. We were waiting, it, we were like uh, waiting for it. And, uh, but hoping for, for, uh, for the uh, engineers that were trying to stabilize the observatory. And then uh, it was that, it was a hard day. And people and the, and the press invited me to go over there to talk from the facility. I say no, I don't want, I didn't want to be there. It was devastating for me. And by late December, I got a call for uh, Abel. Do you want to go to the back to the observatory? I mean, physically, for a movie, for a documentary. And I thought about a moment, and I say. Yes, I will be there. So in January 2021, I came back physically to the observatory to have uh, for uh, filming a documentary, a big, uh, uh, I didn't realize at that time how big it was, <laughs> but uh, it was it was huge. Huh. And they invited me to participate in this um, uh, complicated <laughs> movie about observatory Interesting. and i showing i want to share with you sure. a few clips so this is the arecibo cinematography project this is the general name so i'm not telling you the the actual uh, oh this is not the name of the, the uh this is not the name of the documentary but uh this is no. the uh this is the code name <laughs> the, the code name this is the <laughs> this is the code name because uh it, it would be re it's a secret it's still a secret because it will be released at some really some point and this year, late this year, and uh, and it was hard for me to be there because yes. looking at the picture and even looking at the collapse, the video that you uh, uh, show us, mm -hmm. it for me is like w w it was like watching science fiction. Like I never, I could not believe that that's happened. That's that's it. that's sci-fi. That's CGI. Right. That can't. But happen. actually, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but uh, being there and looking at the familiar place and not seeing that huge platform in the center that was really hard for me and uh, huh. to show you that uh that what you see here is after it collapsed and the top of the of the towers got stripped down but the towers are functional so they could be used for a new instrument about 70 percent of the dish can be used and here you see at the center there is a smaller dish that nobody knows about because it was it was the iconic receiver observatory was the only instrument that everybody knows but they're all the instrument like this small dish yeah and and here in the is a, a scene from the from the documentary where you will see this uh smaller dish this is the crew during the filming in different areas of the observatory. This is the control room, and they're filming. They were filming different scenes there, including the uh, control room with the view. the The main platform was supposed to be here, and that's that's what uh, the controllers and these decks to the right are the places where you control the the, the observatory. Well, they used to control the observatory. Uh, but everything here is 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 working, and at least using other uh, smaller instruments around the observatory. Uh, this was a small house. I if you saw the movie Contact, and oh, yes. uh, there's <laughs> there, there was a scenes filmed in these houses. Th mm -hmm. These are guest houses, part of the observatory. They are nearby. There are four oh, of them. Okay, and they are they are, uh, they have like a a, a hotel there very nice hotel but they still have these houses because it's it's uh it's, it's they are charm <laughs> and uh and for families they are good for families so this is during uh, filming one of the scenes there through the morning time and they also film this is my home office oh, my own oh, nice. home office and they decided to also film a few scenes there and what is not correct here is there is uh is very orange <laughs> And they put uh, a smoke machine, and I, I felt like uh, they were filming uh, Blade Runner or something during this process. <laughs> so, so, so they're, they're, 
it was it was it was neat it was neat because they are that atmosphere this mystery atmosphere so they're uh it's a documentary have some uh reenactment of the uh, life or or uh, many of the scientists who have done the uh, the legacy observatory the history of the observatory and it has uh it discussing like the future of the observatory the future but i cannot talk yes i cannot talk that much about that wait 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 the future of the observatory yes there's a future i mean i'm yes, i mean yes. i know that i know that you know the the visitor center is still there I, I i mean i think it's what the nsf the national science foundation said was yeah you know uh keep the visitor center open and you know it's, uh, but um what's the possibility of i mean you do well, actually you are you actually showed it already you do have an additional radio telescope it's a lot smaller right so mm -hmm. that's going to keep mm -hmm. operating Yes, and there are other instruments to study the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But scientists got together after the first failures of the cable. And we're talking about how to save the observatory, and we explore the alternative. If something goes wrong, what are we going to do? Hmm. So we started writing uh, white papers oh. about ideas, ideas about what could be a, a future telescope. And if you want to re gonna rebuild a telescope, you want to do to rebuild something uh, much better. It's not to construct something similar, but to construct a much uh, better telescope. So probably it will look uh, quite different that uh, uh, originally. One of the idea is to construct a phase array observatory. So it's, it won't be a single dish, but many dishes about 1,000 small dishes, probably each nine meters, taking the whole surface. There, will, there won't be nothing hanging like the uh, heavy uh, uh, platform there. A, each dish has their own uh, receiver. And that provide many advantage. It will be, even that is uh, uh, about smaller still than the one in China fast, it will be, as sensitive because it will take advantage of uh, new technologies, and uh, and it will be able to see a, have a wider range of view of the sky. So, so the, the, so the all the dishes will be as a platform together. All right, so, so to make sure I understand, I mean, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So you're saying that okay, obviously, the your 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 proposal is well, maybe not hang the, the 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 receiver up and suspend it like they like they did back then, but instead take that valley, take that uh, basin, fill it up with smaller with a with a phased array system, right? So basically, you have a number of smaller dishes, but you have they're more sensitive. And you mentioned the China's fast telescope, which is the largest single aperture telescope in the world, is five. Hundred meters, and mm -hmm. yet this is—you said this would be as sensitive as fast, even though it's small. As sensitive, yeah. The area will be three hundred meters, and you have to remember that uh, fast—the whole dish is five hundred, uh, five hundred meters. But when it's observing, it uses a fraction like that, a fraction of the area, because uh, it, it's using the large area to as a pointing. So mm -hmm. whenever you are pointing, you are looking or, or, or reflecting out of a small area, about the size of a receiver, actually, <laughs> a little right. bit bigger. So that's why it was, it, it was more sensitive. It's not using the whole dish at the same time. That's so that's why this, this one will be about that same uh, spot and uh, a little bit larger than the, the original. And okay. uh, but multiple dishes have we have a, a, they're like multiple eyes working together, right? It's a and we have the radar eye. capability, yes, and the radar capabilities, and that's uh, one idea of the best that can happen. Hmm. But in between, there are fixes because the towers are there, the the uh, uh, dish below seventy percent is still functional, so people are thinking about repairing it. Really, and still then, functional. Like yeah, it actually yeah. would reflect a signal, and despite the yeah. the hole in it, and all that kind of stuff. Fascinating. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and, and they will put the receiver at the instead of hanging the receiver at the bottom in the center okay. and a reflector at the top. So it will be like a Cassegrain uh, okay. configuration telescope. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. That's a, that's that's an interesting idea. So, um, is there any traction on this, or is it still just very much in the early stages at this point? Uh, do you have any ideas to put the? It is still is is still uh, early stages, and this June the National Science Foundation, which on the observatory, will have a workshop through the all June, and they invited scientists from everywhere to join forces and uh, to have uh, bring ideas, and they will explore the pro the objective of this workshop is to explore ideas, okay. ideas in the short term, and in the long term, like. Uh, like the phase array telescope. And then uh, after that, uh, these ideas have to materialize in proposals. So people will write in proposal through this year. And uh, and those that require uh, a big instrument will take some time. Mm -hmm. Usually it, it, huge instruments like a receivable take 10 years. Sure. For for from from the beginning of the idea for uh, to actually build the, the, the telescope, but in between, we might be fixing it, uh, working with other smaller instruments that will be built around it, hmm. and, uh, and probably using the the reflector as it. You can still have uh, a smaller uh, receiver at some point and use a fraction of the area without re repairing all the reflector. There are many ideas there that. So there's, there's hope out there. for Arecibo. There's a chance this could be resurrected in, in some manner. And that's uh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty we cool. just lost the big telescope. Arecibo Observatory is still working, and we will be working forever. <laughs> but it doesn't have the big eye. Well, there in between something will happen, and eventually we should have a bigger eye. <laughs> That would, that would be cool. Well, it's something to look forward to. And, and obviously, no one's happy that the, the old telescope is no longer no longer there. Uh, but the fact that there's a, a way, there's a, there's a possible path forward, and, and the best minds are going to be thinking about it. And uh, let's go. I can carry CK. Well, uh, Pez, uh, actually, uh, this guy right over here, he, he's the guy you want to be carrying the suitcases for. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think there's uh, there, I think there's definitely a lot of public interest uh, in in seeing uh, er Arecibo brought back, and I really want to know more about this documentary. But I I I can kind of get the vibe that there's only so much you can really talk about right now. Uh, does it come out this year or does it come out next year? Uh, when when no, when definitely is... definitely it will come uh, this year. Oh, it, it is okay. this year. Okay. It is this year, and there are many. And I cannot tell many things because there are many surprises there. Oh, many man. surprises. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had a hard time. I just I started to see because I had to review the movie or to, for the science. Yeah. And when I eat, I started to see the movie. It, first, it's beautiful. It, it's beautiful. The music. They have uh, composers and uh, write new music and an orchestra. Wow. In different locations. This is like a in big UK, budget. This is like a major Yeah, the orchestra from UK and in Puerto Rico, they have uh, wow. the orchestra music. So it is original music. So it has, it, there are so many details there. And uh, they they took a lot of care to be something good. Not only, it's a, it's, it's, it's a story, a personal story. A, a, and it was very hard for me to see at the beginning what they were showing is uh is, is kind of sentimental well i can sentimental for <laughs> for the observatory of course. but then it, it it takes you everywhere from past present and the future of the observatory and you will be definitely surprised that you say if you think i haven't seen that before yeah oh because uh it's it, yes okay it's for the moon all right, all right. Then I'm not going to ask you to spill uh, any any more beans. You've been really generous with the information you share with us so far. I don't know about you, everybody, but I'm I'm pretty I'm looking forward to seeing this documentary about the Arecibo Observatory. I want to see it yesterday. I want to see it like you know like on my screen. Actually, I want to see it. I want to come down to Puerto Rico and see this thing. And I know it's not the way it used to be, but 
just to be there. Um, this has yeah, always well, been on my bucket list. I definitely want to come down. The documentary it. will be the documentary will be released everywhere internationally. It's in English, right. and uh, and uh, I can confirm to you now that once we have the release for the trailer, I already talked with the uh, director of the uh, of the project, and definitely. It's okay. I want to be back in your program with the director, and then show showcase their uh, the trailer in your show. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be fantastic. Holy crap! I mean, sorry. Uh, wow. I mean, so you guys could like you and the director could come on and 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 show us all the trailer. Yes, that would be I already so talked cool. to him. He, he was excited. Yes, he said yes. <laughs> Hey, what do y'all think, everybody? Is that okay with you? Are we gonna could put it, let, let us know if you want to see this trailer and the director and Professor Mendez to come and share it with us here on Launchpad Astronomy. Just give us a yes in the chat and we'll make it happen. I mean, that would be oh so cool. So thank you very much. This is exciting. I mean, yeah, look at the yeah, even even my wife says it's wow and, and that's really nice of her to say that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I I'm not gonna be able to get all these on the on the screen, but yes, it's so wonderful to see so much exciting. Yeah, I I you know, Bez, I knew I, I Bez, uh, I, I knew I was gonna have to have this guy back. He's so great. So this is this is some that's some really cool news, and thank you so much for for dropping that big bomb right here on on the show. Yes. Thank you very <laughs> kindly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we have a plan uh, to uh, have you back. Um, please let me know when mm -hmm. uh, you and the uh, and the director are available. We will certainly make that happen. Uh, it will be uh, delightful. To, to do that uh, I just thank you so much for for coming on uh, tonight and, and does one does a one-legged <laughs> Nicholas says does the one-legged duck swim in a circle that's a good one that's really I like that <laughs> does a one thank you so much for coming on tonight and and talking with us we've actually gone over our hour uh, 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 by a fair amount and I apologize for for keeping you on uh, Abel, but uh, this has just been uh, a delightful conversation. And and yes, of course, you are welcome back at any time. So thank you once again. And please, everybody, make sure you show uh, Professor Abel uh, Mendez some love here uh, for being so generous with this time tonight. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Well, uh, so, you know, uh, let's take a trip down to Puerto Rico. I have a family down there. Yeah, okay. I think we can make that happen. You know, so... <laughs> It's a bucket list. Actually, I was actually I visited Puerto Rico when I was a child, and um, I still remember it vividly. You know, and I always wanted to go back. So, more than more than enough excuses or reasons to go. Well, back. you are welcome. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it, and thank you uh, all of you for watching with us tonight and for joining us. Uh, and I do want to just as I close out this evening uh, again, just with gratitude to my guests tonight. I also want to take a moment and thank everybody for their wonderful comments and their questions. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to every single one of them. I do apologize. Try to run through as many as I could. Uh, but uh, I also want to say thank you to those of you for the super chats, for those generous super chats. It's so appreciated and i hope none of you are my students because you're broke and you can't afford it uh but uh if you know, but thank you so much for the super chats and for helping to keep the lights on i'd also like to take a second and thank these people right here my patreon supporters for keeping launchpad astronomy going and i'd also uh like to give a special shout out to my cosmological and intergalactic level uh supporters one here, sorry. Uh, and if you would like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you won't miss out miss out on any new videos. Because now that the semester's over, I can get back to making videos again. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to doing more of that. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And please, everybody, have a wonderful evening and stay curious, my friends. Good night. How do I shut this thing off? <laughs> I can't shut it off. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>